Hello everyone, what is up? My name is Reese, and we are back at it with part two of continuating my last video that I made that was talking about more stock market fundamentals. It ended up taking a little bit longer to get through than I originally intended to. So this is part two where I will be diving into a little bit about how compound inv dividend investing works as well as compound growth and then some tools that you can use to help you know, understand what you're investing in how that can help fit your goals and then some easy to use tools to help you visualize how realistic your saving goals might be and how much you need to set aside for those goals. So starting off, I will, this will be probably be a about five to 10 minute presentation that I like as previously before, this is a PowerPoint that I made for close friends and family, but I'll be sharing the key takeaways essentially of that presentation. So starting off, talking a little bit about the power of compound growth. And so the agenda of this short presentation will be talking about what the snowball effect is and how dividend effect funds can come into play in regards to that. And then some potential financial path that could help you get to your first million dollars, uh, a portfolio suggestion. Now this is, before I get into it, this is not my recommended portfolio. This is not even what I own personally, it's simply, a kind of a visualization of what a portfolio might look like for those who have similar investing goals. And so without further ado, let's get into it. So this is a, a brief visualization of, visualization of the power of compounding. And so what we have here is a case study where someone initially deposited $2,000 with a recurring monthly contribution of $2,000 into an investment account with a 10% annual growth rate over 20 years. I know that was a mouthful, but essentially if they were to set that $2,000 aside with a 0% interest rate over time, they would have had $480,000 in that time period. Now, if they invested in, let's say the S and P 500 with a sustained 10% growth rate, now we know there will be downturns and upturns, but that is kind of the averaged out long-term historical growth rate. And it has been so far historically proven that if you hold a stock, hold the S&P 500 for more than 20 years, you have never had a, a negative return. Granted, you might not have a huge return depending on the market conditions, but holding long-term, the overall market is a great way to really invest in long-term capital appreciations. So by investing in, let's say, th this compound growth fund where you're growing at 10% a year, and as you are, over time, those earnings are going to compound more and more through interest. Uh, we're going to call it interest. And so that 480000 that would have been 480000 with 0% APR, have turned into $1.5 million total. So here's a visualization of the principal over time. You know, you're, you're growing it at $2,000 per month. But over time, that compound interest is compounding and compounding and compounding. You get to a point where you are compounding faster than you are contributing money into the account. And so in the long run, that compound interest growth is really what makes your portfolio stand out in gains wise compared to just investing in a cash account. And these, one thing to take into account, if you're going at 10% year rate, it is hardest for most people to save that first 100,000 than it is to turn that 100,000 into $1 million. I know that sounds crazy, but through the power of compound growth, it is much easier to gain these higher amounts of money as once you have money. So getting the money to begin with is the hard part. And so that's why typically getting that first $100,000 is the hardest part for most people. And so why you, sh you should consider dividends. So presented below is a, an example of investing $100,000 into a dividend fund, SCHD. SCHD is Charles Schwab's high dividend fund, which tracks the Dow 100 dividends index. And so... What this index is in a nutshell, which I will be doing a video breaking down this fund because I really believe it is a great investment option. It essentially tracks companies with a historical, historically been paying dividends at a higher than average yield with strong financial fundamentals. And so 
these companies are growing their dividends over time with a strong payout. And so over time, if you are in reinvesting those dividends, you can what is called the snowball effect, meaning your money's getting and reinvested and reinvested. And due to compound interest and compound growth, the more money you have in the snowball, the m more it'll grow. So these dividends, as they're getting reinvested, they are growing and larger and larger. And so this is visualized down below where, remember, this is $100,000 being invested at once. Not a single more dollar is contributed. This is all through dividends. And so portfolio income, meaning that how much dividends is being paid, you know, is about a little over 3000 in 2012. And then five years later in 2017, we're now at 6000 so about double the dividend growth. And then five years later, because compounding start coming into play, you're now getting you know, a little over $11,000 a month or a year in dividends. So now we're getting an 11% yield per in dividends from our initial $100,000 investment. And that's just going to keep growing and growing and growing. And not only are we getting these dividend incomes, but SCHD has good capital appreciation. It's actually kept up with the overall market very well. You know, this index fund doesn't have companies like Apple in it, for example, but it's still growing at a nice capital appreciation rate. So that's why I will be doing a vi separate video diving into this a little more. And then getting to a million dollars is a feat that many people will not reach. However, it is possible if you have your goals properly aligned and you are able to set aside money. So things to keep in mind is you really need to make a budget plan to start investing now. Time is your ally. So when you invest earlier and you have more time on your side, you have much more time for that snowball to compound. So may, I've heard this many times from people that are close to me that people wish that they knew about even something like a Roth IRA in their 20s and they're just now starting to invest in it maybe in their late 30s 40s or even 50s so the earlier you can invest in that the more time you're letting it sit in the market and compound and so one thing I recommend is if you're wanting to invest not doing lump sums lump sum investments throughout the year but instead just say $500 of your paycheck or even $100 you can use a brokerage that allows you to automate your investing and let you buy fractional shares. So let's say VTI, for example, is floating around $200 per share. VTI is a Vanguard total market index fund. And if you're only investing $100 a week, you can still buy half a share even time, every time without having to wait until you can buy a whole share. So Robinhood and M1 Finance, for example, allow you to do those automated fractional share purchases of ETFs. And that can help you just make it more easy to manage your goals to help just set it and forget it. Webull and SoFi also allow these automated investments as well, but it's not something I was familiar with and I personally don't have an account with them, so I can't truly recommend them. But one thing to keep in mind with these strategies is that you want to invest often and consistently. Do not trying to time the markets tends to do poorly. There are many people who try to beat the market, but many people fail. And so here's a fin personal finance flow that and general that's commonly recommended for people who are trying to figure out what needs to be their priorities. So when you have money coming in. The first things you really need to prioritize are your essentials and needs. You know, things like rent, utilities, groceries, car insurance, you know, gasoline for your car to get to work, stuff like that. Things that you need. Second, you should take full advantage of any tax advantage retirement accounts that you have. So just say you have an employer sponsored 401k with a 5% employer match. Definitely, at a minimum, contribute that 5%. Because if you're not contributing that 5%, you are leaving free money on the table. When I say free money, I mean your company is literally paying you to contribute in that 401k, dollar for dollar up to that 5%. Now, anything beyond that 5%, you know, you're not, may, you might not be getting matched, but you are still getting money set aside. And if you're investing in, let's say, a traditional 401k, that will help you lower your taxes today because those are tax deferred. Now, if you have a Roth account like a Roth IRA or Roth 401k which I'll get into later on a separate video but 
those are paid with post-tax earnings, meaning that any earnings that you achieve in a Roth a retirement account, they grow tax-free, so you can pull out. You can really save in the long run if you are, let's say, a lower tax bracket now. And then anyways, besides maxing out tax advantage retirement accounts and HSAs, you want to make sure you're setting aside money towards a one to two year emergency savings fund. This is the thing that most people, who, especially people who are living paycheck to paycheck, can, it can be really difficult to do that. So it's really important to help set that money aside for when you need it. And so it's good. What I recommend is not investing that money in the stock market, but instead utilizing either CDs or high yield savings account can really help you generate you know, nice returns. Now, if you do invest in a CD, one thing to keep in mind is a lot of CDs have penalties for pulling out earlier if you can withdraw at all. So high yield savings are you, probably your best bet. And then once you have a comfortable emergency fund set up, you can, it's good, then you can have more freedom, liberty to spend in your wants pile. Let's say traveling or things that you want that make you happy. Now, I'm not saying you can't have those things if you don't have a two year emergency fund, but keep in mind, make sure you're prioritizing your savings so that you are in a financially stable position. And then lastly, after you have all those piles taken care of, it is good to reinvest, or not reinvest, but invest those, those leftovers into the market in a personal brokerage account. So personal brokerage accounts usually aren't going to be tax advantaged, you know, like a Roth or a IRA or a 401k, but it is good to help grow your wealth so that it's not just necessarily sitting in a checking account or savings account, not really growing to its true potential. And then, as I mentioned before about the retirement accounts, it's really good to take advantage of those while you can. Also, if you have an HSA, not everyone will have an HSA, but if you do have an HSA, one thing to know about them is anything that's in an HSA, typically you can invest it in a stock market, for example, and you once you reach the age of 60, that money can be pulled out and used for whatever you want. And HSA accounts are tax-free in and out, meaning it is basically a tax shelter to grow money. Now these do have contribution limits, but in the long run, it can kind of be a useful tool to help you grow your savings. And so how to choose funds. I recommend diversifying your portfolio based on your personal risk tolerances and experience of the market. So are you looking for shorter term holdings? Or are you looking for long term 10, 20, 30 years? So if you're looking for short term holdings, you might be better suited off in just a CD or a bank account. But once you start streaming your time horizon, you know, then you can start looking at the overall market and ETFs that can help you suit those goals. So things to, some people choose to uh, invest in bonds, real estate, growth stocks, value, cryptocurrencies, commodities. There's th tons of things that people can invest their money in. But what keeps, keep this in mind, there is no right or wrong answer. It all comes down to your personal investment strategy and beliefs. What works for me will not work for you necessarily. Now, th there could be things that could be recommended for everyone, such as I recommend a good, strong core holding. What I mean by core holding was what that is what's going to serve as the backbone of your portfolio. Typically, people will invest in things like VTI, which is a Vanguard Total Market Fund, or the S&P 500, which an equivalent, the commonly traded one is SPY, but you can also invest in a Vanguard equivalent, VU, V-O-O. These will have lower expense ratios than typically other investment <coughs> investment companies. And so growth stocks, as I mentioned in my previous video, can have higher short-term yields, but in the long run, value typically does outperform. And you can also incorporate some smaller mid-cap exposure to help you get exposure to those companies that may not be included in the S&P 500. So really, don't overcomplicate your portfolio by buying 100 different index funds and everything. You want to keep it as simple as possible while meeting your investment goals. And so once you have a million dollars, if <laughs> once you do, if you're able to reach the prestigious amount of $1 million or more in your personal brokerage account, it's important to know that don't pull that out. You've worked hard to get it that high and anything you pull out, let's say if you pulled out to buy a house in cash, you are prematurely 
you know, cutting off that compounding. And so once you have your portfolio to a higher amount that, you know, maybe you want to pull back the brakes a little bit and make it a little bit less risky by decreasing your exposure to stocks, you could, for example, increase your exposure to more dividend value oriented companies that will pay you dividends. That way you are getting a constant passive income without having to worry about selling shares of your stocks to pay yourself basically. And then another thing is a 4% rule commonly that's pretty commonly talked about where if you sell 4% or less of your portfolio every year, ideally your portfolio shouldn't have to run out. And financial freedom is a path that many do not achieve, but it's something that many work towards. And if you can, if you're able to achieve that, you know, a lot of people refer to it as FIRE, financial independence to retire early. And you can, if you're able to reach a financially free position, you know, you could potentially focus less on working as much and focus more on either what makes you happy, whether it's raising a family, personal hobbies, side hustles that you can do for fun rather than having to worry about it supporting your lifestyle. And really what it comes down to is you want to maintain your portfolio as much as possible until if you have retirement accounts kicking in at 60, let's say once you reach 60, your 401k and HSA IRAs, they all become accessible penalty free. So you basically you want to build your portfolio as much as you can until you're 60. And then once you hit that, you can kind of pull the brakes back. Here's a sample portfolio. And as I said, this is a sample portfolio. This is not what my personal portfolio is going to look at like, and there's actually changes that I would make to it. But this is simply to show you potentially what someone might look like a portfolio might look like with a strong core holding exposure to some dividends as well as exposure to the extended market so in this sample portfolio the backbone is vti the vanguard total u.s market which is a composition of basically large small and mid cap stocks beyond the s p 500 400 and 600 and so with vti being the core holding of 45 percent we're including SCHD, which is, I believe that might be my personal favorite dividend ETF because of its strong financials and how everything works, which I'll do another video, as I said, talking about it, because I really believe this is a pretty crazy index fund. And so exposure to that to help build my passive income, and then including IJH and IJR, which are those index funds with relatively low expense ratios and high liquidity to gain exposure to the small mid caps. And so the reason I've in the sample portfolio allocated a smaller percentage to those is because they are going to be a little bit more risky short term assets. They are going to be a little bit more fluctuating and small and mid cap are technically included in the total market already. But investing in these smaller you know, market caps on their own can kind of help you gain exposure to potentially either beat the market in the long run or just further diversify because there have been periods where large companies have been doing poorly and small and mid-sized companies have been doing a little bit better in comparison and vice versa and stocks disregard the top left wall street bets you know wall street bets is kind of an animal on its own uh, i actually do follow wall street bets but not necessarily as an investment strategy and but I like to kind of just keep up with what they're doing, what's going on. And it can kind of, it's interesting keeping up with it because it can kind of show you what not to do. Things, you know, maybe you shouldn't gamble all of your money in life savings and house money on options on that are one day away from ex expiration and out of the money. You know, who would have thought that that might have gone what bad? You know, just saying. So I kind of just use Wall Street bets if I'm bored scrolling through and be like, you know what? I'm not going to buy that because that's what all these guys are doing. And yeah, they can, they, they have pumped some stocks before, but usually 99.9 times out of 10, and that, that was intentionally 99 times out of 10, they're holding bags. Now I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about some simple tools that you can use, such as Morningstar.com. Morningstar.com is really nice because it can kind of help you basically get x-ray of your index funds or mutual funds that you're looking into potentially buying to really see what you were buying and what the performance has looked like. And I will perform link or include links of this in the description below. But starting off with Morningstar, whenever you look up, I'm going to start off with VTI. So you can search for VTI 
and we will click portfolio and portfolio will allow us to see what this what is actually composing this com this index fund so we go by weight and we can see that Vanguard total market which is a market cap weighted c company is dominated by you know these large cap companies but exposure to mid and small cap as well and this is more growth oriented because as of right now the S&P 500 is being heavily driven by tech companies and similar to the S&P 500 the top holdings are going to be Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Tesla, Google, Berkshire Hathaway, stuff like that where it's going to be these big name companies that are driving the performance. Now this could change where value becomes more dominant if growth were to pull back but this is just kind of a showing you how this company this index fund is being managed and what is in it you can use this to see long-term performance relative to let's say peers for example and just a general overall expense ratio of 0.03 for example you can kind of really dig into it to see I mean, it even says one of the best funds for broad ma market exposure i think it i think it is really if you were to invest in only one index fund for 30 or 40 years I'd say VTI would probably be the one to go with because of how diversified it is, includes market multiple market cap sizes and you know it has a 1.74% dividend yield as of right now, which you know is not the worst thing. You're getting some that is more than covering the expense ratio, for example. And so it kind of just helps this can kind of help you see the breakdown, analysis, stuff like that to really help better inform you of what is in your index funds and it also has analysis of individual stocks as well to kind of help you make this better informed decisions of what you should invest in another tool i'm going to talk about is etfoverlap.com which is etfrc i know it does not stand for it but etf overlap what is it and what is it used for so etf overlap fund overlap in principle is when you're buying two index funds that both have similar holdings Meaning, let's just say you're buying VUG, which is a Vanguard growth fund, and the S&P 500. A lot of those companies are overlapped. Even when you first pull it up, when you first pull up the website, it's going to show the overlap between SPY and QQQ. For those who don't know, SPY is SP 500 in index fund, and then QQQ is a NASDAQ 100 index fund. And, it, and the two currently have an overlap by weight of 39%. And 78% of QQQ's holdings are also in the S&P 500. To pull up VTI, 91.2% of QQQ's holdings are in VTI. Now, honestly, I'm kind of surprised that's not more, but VTI is kind of a general exposure to the overall market of how the U.S. market is doing fundamentally. So QQQ and SPY, okay, and SPY and VTI, as you can see, because the total market is market cap weighted, the S&P 500 is the main driver of that performance. So I would not buy both VTI and SPY because they are so heavily overlapped. You're not really gaining anything in diversification. Now, when we look at the SPY, um, remember in my, in my previous video, I mentioned it, but S&P 500 is broken down into ma two main categories, value and growth. For example, if we look at VUG Vanguard growth, 50% of the S&P 500 is overlapped in a growth fund. And we look at VTV, which is a Vanguard value fund, 51% as well are in S&P 500. So we compare VTV and VUG, you know, there's a very minimal overlap. So that that means is VTV and VUG growth and value on their own have very minimal overlap. But when you combine them together, you basically get the S&P 500. So rather than buying both, you could just buy the S&P 500. And instead of buying the S&P 500, you could just buy the Vanguard total market. Now, I know there's a lot of words coming out of my mouth, but really you can use this to help, you know, determine if funds that you are interested in buying are really what they say they are. And if so, are they potentially just the same thing? You know, there's no reason to buy both VU and SPY. VU is a Vanguard SP 500. They have a 99.2 overlap. You know, it's, 
they are essentially this they are the same thing you know they might ha and when you have portfolios that are exactly the same this could help you pick a fund that has a lower expense ratio so you're paying less in the long run and lastly the last topic of this video this is a little bit longer most of my videos in the future will be targeted more towards 10 minutes or less but because these are early big picture investment ideas these will i am spending a little bit longer going through them so i'm going to talk a little bit about another tool that i like to use it is a simple compound interest calculator to help you show the power of compound interest and how investing in the long run can really help you save money so let's just say you are trying to gain a million dollars 30 years from now you could play around with this to see what kind of interest rate or returns you would need as well as how much you'd need to save a month. So let's just say you have no savings right now and you use this tool and start off with initial investment of $500. So you're depositing $500 and you are saving $500 a month for 30 years and at an estimated interest rate of 10%. Now that S&P 500 has historically since 1960 gave you about 10 and a half percent, but I'm just gonna do a 10% estimated interest rate or estimated return and another thing that's cool about this is you can have an interest rate variance range meaning let's say if we put two percent it'll show you what your graph would look like your returns would look like if you got 12 percent or eight percent return and then compound frequency we're going to do monthly because we're contributing monthly but you can play around with it and see how it looks so in 30 years if you start with nothing invest 500 dollars a month consistently you'll have $1.1 million. If you were to get 12% on the higher end consistently, which realistically, you know, it's less likely to happen, you could have 1.7 million. And on the low end, 8% over 30 years is considered a poor in poorer investment return wise, but you'll still have 750,000. So starting with nothing and sticking with that $500 a month over time, you can be a millionaire. And this is to show you how starting early is really the key because even if we start and we investing a thousand a month for just 10 years less, you still have less. So even though we're con contributing, contributing twice as much per month, if we cut that down by 10 years, you know, we're really hurting our returns. So time is your friend. If you're investing less over the long run, you will generate more in returns typically than investing a lot in the short run. And you can play around with this yourself to really prove that, that that's true. So basically what I like about this tool is it can really help visualize how much you need to save over what time, time horizon to reach your goals. And let's just say you're investing all that money. So back to the original of oh, 30 years. 1.1 million. That was a great example accidentally. So if we cut that from 30 years down to 20 years, 383,000. So we have like a third of what we could have if we, you know, let it sit for a little longer. Um, so what I want to show is let's do an interest rate of 2%. This is, you know, as of right now, kind of a typical high yield savings yield. If we were to invest all that money for 30 years in a high yield savings, we'll have 250,000. So that really shows you when you have time on your side, investing in the total market can really help you save money. And it should, this, I'll also include a calculator for simple interest. This is more used for, let's say, if you're doing bonds. Bonds don't typically let you get a compound interest rate. What they will do, though, is pay you consistent payouts over time if the bond is not default, which I will do a video separately about covering bonds and how they could potentially be used to help minimize your diversify your portfolio to be a little bit less risk exposed but in times of high interest yields bonds can kind of be a more attractive alternative to stocks because if the yield is high and you're investing in a quality company or the u.s government for example with a low risk of default these high yields are more guaranteed and you're getting a consistent payout and if you were to say you buy a hundred thousand of bonds or ten thousand dollars of bonds those 
dividends or interest that you're earning throughout the year, you can invest that, you can spend it, you can do whatever you want, and you're growing that over time. So like I said, I'll have to do another video of that specifically, but I just wanted to kind of put these tools on your radar of how you could use them to potentially your advantage to help arm yourself with knowledge and skills to help take on your future. And so I hope you guys found this inve uh, investing, ad not necessarily advice, but just kind of sharing what things that I found that have helped me personally kind of learn and make a game plan for myself that could potentially help you make your own plan. So I'll put all these links in the description. Hope you guys enjoyed it and found it helpful. As I said, I'll be focusing more towards shorter focused videos now that I've kind of dumped out two longer videos that kind of just a brief overview of how everything works for those who are interested. So I hope you guys enjoyed this kind of content and uh, and most of these are going to be, you know, kind of a one take thing cuz I'm not the best at video editing as of right now. It's something I hope to grow and improve on skill-wise, but hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please leave a like, comment below if you guys found it useful, things that you might want to see in the future and feedback is always appreciated you know i'm still working on this i'm it's not as used to talking to a camera or even the web the background you know that's nvidia broadcast i'm just kind of testing it out for now but that's things that we'll work on and hopefully i will get better at over time as i get more comfortable doing this but i'm gonna roll hope you guys had a, a great rest of your day hope you guys enjoy this video thank you guys goodbye